Well, John, thank you so much for joining us today for Community Quotes. If you can, say and spell your first and last name for us. Uh, John Bess, J-O-H-N-B-E-S-S. -S. Okay, John. Uh, so tell us a little bit about yourself growing up. Uh, what town did you grow up in and what was it like? I uh, was born in Monroe, Louisiana, and I grew up in nearby Columbia, Louisiana. Uh, it was a small farm town. Um, you know, cotton was the major uh, crop. Um, a lot of fishing, a lot of hunting. Uh, neighbors knew one another. It seemed as if every other neighbor had a garden. And uh, so, you know, rustic uh, upbringing and uh, learned a lot of values, not only from myself, but uh, from the uh, elders in the uh, community who at that time um, were, you know, looking out for the well-being of all of the uh, youth, mm -hmm. uh, trying to impart uh, some wisdom and keep them in line. So it was, you know, I wouldn't necessarily say Norman Rockwell, but, uh, you know, some of the uh, depictions you see in movies and documentaries of small town life, that was the case in Columbia. You know, it was a tight-knit uh, place. Did you have a large family? Uh, I am one of five. I'm the second oldest. Okay. Yes. All so. right. You have to help with chores around the house? Oh, yes. You definitely <laughs> had to help with chores. Everybody had their specific mm -hmm. chores to do. And, uh, you know, it was uh, expected, which is why when we uh, used to watch uh, television shows and uh, the uh, youth would complain about their chores and sometimes, you know, they would uh, get away with it. My uh, mother would quickly uh, admonish me and my siblings that uh, it's not going to be that way around here. You know, right. we have responsibilities and we will meet those responsibilities. Good, good. So what type of chores did you do? And it sounds like you grew up in the country life. Uh, did you help out around, you know, with outside things? And what were some of the values that you learned from that? Well, every day after uh, coming home from school, I had to uh, pump uh, buckets of water. We didn't have indoor uh, plumbing, mm -hmm. uh, so I had to uh, pump uh, buckets of water. I had to... Which I'm sure were heavy to carry. Well, yeah, for a little <laughs> boy. <that. laughs> and also bring in uh, the wood. We, uh, you know, had a uh, stove, uh, wood stove. So, you know, bring in the wood from the uh, wood pile. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, those were What things. do you think that taught you from being a child and reflecting back? Um, because I know a lot of children now don't have those type of responsibilities. So what did that instill in you? Well, it's interesting you should ask that because uh, um, I'm a school teacher by trade and I speak to my uh, students about how it was when I was growing up, when I was their age and uh, younger. What it teaches you is to uh, focus on um, hard work and to develop uh, perseverance because so many of uh, the youth today and some of the youth back then did not have chores mm -hmm. and we should think that they were more fortunate but in retrospect, they weren't because um, hard work, you learn at a young age that you can develop that focus, you know, that character does build character. And then when the harder things come later in life, you know that you can power through them mm -hmm. Yeah, from that early lesson. Yeah. Great, great advice. Uh, I know you work uh, through the school system, uh, but looking back as a child, did you have a favorite school teacher or look up to your school teachers? Uh, yes, I had many uh, favorite uh, school teachers. Uh, starting off, uh, Miss Woods, my first grade teacher. Uh, we started uh, first grade uh, when I uh, school in Caldwell Parish in 1968. Uh, they did not have uh, kindergarten. Mm -hmm. uh, kindergarten, uh, you know, came the uh, following uh, year. Uh, so uh, I started in the first grade, mm -hmm. and uh, Miss Woods was a taskmaster, but she loved us. Mm -hmm. At that time, it was still um, segregated uh, schools. Mm -hmm. um, the deliberate speed of uh, Brown versus the Board of Topeka, Kansas, took 17 years for Caldwell Parish, uh, 1971. Mm -hmm. So we were still segregated, but we had uh, loving teachers, professional teachers, and they had taught our uh, parents. Uh, so mm -hmm. if I stepped out of line, you know, she would uh, uh, talk to my mom, and my mom would talk to me. Mm -hmm in ways that uh, are not uh, necessarily pleasant, but uh, <laughs> she got the message across, yes. so yes. Yeah. 
And from there, um, when we did integrate, um, one of my great teachers and many people um, in the community, if not all, Ms. Simons, who, Simon, Martha Simon, who later became uh, the superintendent of Caldwell Parish, was just fascinating and creative and she stimulated us with great projects and, and field trips and she uh, always wanted us to see the uh, future. So myself and many other um, students talk about her wonderful influence on us. So Martha Simon did a great job in education and I have aspired to be um, like her with my students to have that stimulative effect while they remember you uh, for many positive uh, you know, endeavors in their lives. When you were a child or a young adult, did you think you would be in the school system did, or did you want to be something completely different, uh, like an astronaut or a doctor? <laughs> <laughs> well, when I was young, uh, thinking about uh, my teachers and education, uh, you know, becoming a teacher was the furthest thing from my mind and, you know, my playmates mind because mm -hmm. we looked upon teachers as being square. You know, yeah. so to, to be a teacher is like, uh, you know, wow. And we also looked upon them as being old people, you know, it's like, wow. Right. But, um, you know, as time passed, I, uh, uh, you know, did some subbing with special ed students and, uh, you know, you fall in love with them. They become like a extended part of your family. So, uh, you know, uh, from mass communications, I entered uh, education and, you know, have never looked back. So where did you go to high school and, and then pursue your college uh, career or business? I went to the mighty Caldwell Parish <laughs> High School in Columbia, Louisiana. Uh, and from there at age 17, um, I entered the United States Air Force. Okay. Uh, I knew from uh, roughly my junior year that I was going into the Air Force. Um, I had basically at that time had, a, and it's interesting, had enough of uh, farm life. Mm -hmm. uh, so I wanted to experience the world, so I felt that they would send me around the world. And um, on my dream sheet, I had uh, put um, stateside California or Florida. Mm -hmm. And they decided to send me to, and it, it was appropriately named a dream sheet, because I, 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 I dreamt being sent to California or Florida, right. but I was sent to Barksdale Air Force uh, Base. In Shreveport. In Shreveport, yeah, <laughs> Boja City, yeah. And I stayed there all four years. <laughs> All four years. Some dream. <laughs> yes. You never some, left some Louisiana. <laughs> didn't leave Louisiana. Uh, when I uh, jo uh, departed from the Air Force and um, came uh, south to um, USAL at the time, um, two years later I joined in 1986 the uh, Reserve and spent 20 years in the Reserve and went all around the world, Desert Storm and, you know, uh, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, England, Germany. So. Uh, I did get to travel, but it was later <laughs> in the right, reserve. <laughs> right. Well, and in speaking of, of traveling to those countries, um, would you enlighten us a little bit with your experience and uh, your involvement, you know, with the uh, there? Yes, the, my involvement in uh, the foreign countries that I visited was profound. Um, t two uh, municipalities, one is uh, American uh, municipality, Puerto Rico, but let's speak about the foreign country, Denmark. In Denmark, uh, my reserve unit in 1989 uh, went there. That was our um, forward deployed uh, base at the time. And so we trained uh, with Danes and it was a wonderful experience. The Danish cu culture was wonderful. And it was wonderful. They're known as the happiest people on the planet now. But my experience, um, I had expected to encounter um, the experience I've had, had had here in the States, and it was totally different in that they were so accommodating and helpful mm -hmm. and friendly. And for the first day and a half, you know, it was like walking around in a daze because I didn't, uh, couldn't understand what it was I was feeling and the experience I was going through. And it was that they had no uh, societal hang-ups, no mm -hmm. racial hang-ups whatsoever. They were open, they were free, the freest place I had ever uh, been to, and it was, it was just amazing and astounding to experience that. And it, so and it refreshing. was yeah, yeah. refreshing. <laughs> it was definitely a wow experience. Mm -hmm. And then in uh, Puerto Rico, uh, which has recently undergone you know, a tremendous challenge with mm -hmm. the uh, hurricane, right. Um, it was the everybody's family mentality, uh, 
f friend of mine from New York, Angel. Mm -hmm. uh, he visited his family. We were deployed in uh, Aquadilla, uh, Puerto Rico. And so he took me to their home. And since I was his friend, I was an extended member of the family immediately. Mm -hmm. And so I was treated as such. So that was amazing. I mean, I had just met these people and you had the feeling that, okay, you're fit in, you know, just as easy as, you know, one of their other children or, or relatives. So it was, that was a, a wonderful experience as well. Wonderful. Well, it sounds like with your, your military background and of course your educational background, you've met a lot of people. Oh, yes. Who would you say would be the most, or several people, would be the most influential people in your life? Um, the most, uh, starting off, uh, the values that my grandmother taught me, I've never met a person greater than she and a person more warm and with the values that she taught. She taught me how to uh, grow things. She taught me perseverance, you know, by looking at her example. Uh, just a wonderful uh, person, and she's the hardest working person still that I've ever seen, literally, uh, growing up in that uh, environment of, uh, of uh, Columbia, Louisiana. Uh, but here, uh, Father A.J. McKnight, uh, you know, just a wonderful, gigantic presence and a wonderful uh, mentor uh, to me. So he's been the most impactful person uh, that I've met apart from my uh, grandmother and taught some great values. Mm -hmm. um, looking back, on, on your life to date, <laughs> because I'm sure you'll have many more years <laughs> yes, ahead of you. Um, what achievement are you most proud of? Uh, I would say the achievement I'm most proud of is um, the light bulb moment in my uh, student's uh, life. I work with mm -hmm. students from, uh, you know, challenging backgrounds, high poverty, and, uh, you know, some other uh, issues, psychological issues. And um, when you're able to uh, work with them and see that they get the lesson that's being imparted and that you can go above the lesson on campus and visit their family or home visitations to take care of some paperwork and have a relationship with their parents, that makes all the difference. Because they see you as an extended member of their family who cares about them and is willing to uh, work with them but go beyond school and impart something extra to them. And so. Uh, you know, that's been most hardening uh, for me. Sounds like you really take that extra step to get involved in a oh, child's yeah. life and really help them understand that education is one of the most important things there. Oh, absolutely. My grandmother taught me it's the one thing someone cannot take from you. That is it. <laughs> education is indeed the one thing that no one can take from you and it can open a wide variety of uh, paths mm -hmm. and take you to places unknown, undreamt of. Right. Yes. So I'm sure that there are children out there that look to you as a mentor. So thank you for all that you do oh, well, thank with, you. Uh, within the school system. Um, let's switch gears a little bit and let's talk about AOC. How long have you been a member of AOC and how did you first get involved? Uh, I first got involved, I was a mass communication student, first got involved with AOC as a mass communication student uh, in 1980. Nine, I believe it was. Uh, we had a uh, Friday uh, mock uh, news show, and we used the facilities to uh, stage it. And so um, I came. Um, at the time, Bob Larasini was the executive uh, director. Mm -hmm. And then five years later, I um, became a uh, member with uh, David Cratian, uh, who was just a wonderful, he's a fr uh, lifelong friend, and he was a wonderful departed. Uh, now, but he was a wonderful uh, mentor and friend as well. Mm -hmm. And so he was hosting a show, Voices of African Americans, and he invited me to host that. I started actually a show, a community affairs show once a month mm -hmm. uh, entitled Meet with Lab, the Lafayette Area Action Board. And so that one time a month wasn't quite enough. Mm -hmm. So uh, Minister Lau Muhammad had a show uh, in, uh, called In Today's Black News, so I co-hosted with him for uh, several years and then also hosted, co-hosted um, the Voices of African Americans program. And so I've uh, been hosting at AOC for, this is my 24th year. Wow. Yes. A family. Almost work here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we need to put you on payroll. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, do you have any future goals? Is there anything uh, with the show that you want to expand on or anything else with AOC that you want to be involved with in the future? 
Yes, I would like to encourage uh, with AOC uh, more mm -hmm. uh, participation of the um, civilian sector because mm -hmm. still I think in many ways AOC is the best kept secret uh, in Lafayette I with, would what, agree with, you. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> with what you guys do and have uh, done. So to encourage uh, more people to get involved and produce shows because there are a lot of hidden, hidden elements of our community that we hear about you know, from a secondary or tertiary mm -hmm. uh, perspective that could be showcased here at AOC. And it's uh, virtually free. I mean, we are very affordable, you know, yeah. so definitely I try to push involvement uh, with AOC and get those uh, unknown stories uh, out there. So, right. yeah. That, that sounds great. I, I need to add you to my marketing staff because <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I think we are the best kept secret in Lafayette. So more people we can get involved, the, the better to practice their freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. um, if you could spend one day in someone else's shoes, who would it be and why? Um, I think if I had to spend one day in someone's shoes, it would be the shoes of a typical uh, female. And I say that for this reason. We know that in Louisiana, females make 66 cents for every dollar that a man makes. And nationally, I believe it's 77 cents. And with everything they go through and what we ha are hearing, mm -hmm. You know, a lot of things have been said about that reality, but I think if men could spend one day <laughs> in the shoes of women, I think we would see an almost overnight change. I would agree with yes, that. Yes, because- That and giving birth. That and giving birth, <laughs> yeah. Because it's still horrific to me that women make only 66 cents yes. for every dollar that a man makes. That's, that's horrendous. Mm -hmm. yes. I would agree. I've, I've been in business over 20 years and-, and mm. I think that's a, a very well uh, put statement. Um, do you have any involvement? Do you get involved with any nonprofit work or any charities in, in the community in Lafayette? And if yes. so, uh, tell me a little bit about that. Uh, the main charity I am involved uh, with, uh, nonprofit, is Cite de Zot, right up the street, 109 Vine. Uh, we are also looking for volunteers, and it's the little theater uh, that could. Uh, this is his 16th uh, year. We have had uh, ballet, Zydeco dance, Cajun dance, uh, French programming, uh, children's theater, regular theater, and then every spring, and we just concluded, the uh, middle school and high school students are able to display their artwork, and also mm -hmm. they have musical uh, programming. So it's a wonderful facility for one and all, and certainly we would like everybody to participate and make this little... Uh, theater that could part of the greater community. If someone's interested in more information about that, uh, is there a website they can go to? There's a website, Cite Des Arts, C I T E D E S A R T S dot org, and the uh, phone number 337 291 1122. 291 1122. And we have a job for you. Doesn't necessarily have to be on the stage, but if you want to be on the stage, <laughs> but we have many behind the scene opportunities as well. And of course, any uh, sponsor that would like to uh, support us, we would love to have you. Uh, we've done wonderful things with uh, our youth. Uh, arts, um, when you see the youth, uh, how they benefit in that light bulb moment on stage or in the mm -hmm. theater, it's wonderful. And nothing can turn on a student like art, a young person like art. As a matter of fact, if I would have had a theater in my small community of uh, Columbia, who knows where I would be now. <laughs> well, let, let's talk about art because I think Lafayette does have several opportunities mm -hmm. for art, but it's not so much in the school systems. How yeah. do you feel about art funding within the schools and um, what's happening with that? Well, I believe it should be increased. As you know, uh, when budgets are tight, mm -hmm. uh, the art program is one of the first to be put on the chopping block or you know offered up. But uh, I think we have to support art and eventually the community will have to support uh, a tax uh, to support education. And art, again, uh, it used to be that uh, an investment uh, with art returns seven dollars uh, for every dollar invested, and now it's many more dollars. So you really can't put a price on it, and certainly you can't put a price on the impact uh, on the kids' uh, lives. Mm -hmm. 
And, uh, you know, we had many people who didn't think of themselves as crea creative. I hear it all the time. You know, I can't draw. I'm not creative. I'm not an artist. And then when we show them what they can do under the uh, appropriate tutelage, uh, they're just amazed and they, they want to display it and, you know, show it to every uh, staff member and, you know, take it home to their mom and the joy that you see emanate from them from their uh, creation because they didn't know that they could be creators. Uh, it's just astounding and wonderful to behold. Great. Well, and in speaking back to the question that I asked you a little earlier about spending a day in someone else's shoes, you mentioned about, you know, women and uh, spending a, a day in a typical businesswoman's world. Uh, but let's talk about school teachers um, because, as we all know, they're, I think they're underpaid, and I think they would agree with me well, on thank that. You. <laughs> we are. <laughs> we are. Do you foresee that changing in the future, or do you think that the reward is greater for a teacher? It's not just about pay, it's making a, a, a change in someone's life. Yeah, it's not just about uh, pay, which is why so many teachers have, uh, you know, stayed with the uh, profession. Mm -hmm. They uh, really want to grow mm -hmm. and impart knowledge, wisdom to our uh, youth of the day. But um, speaking of that, I, on NPR, I recently heard a, um, a sad uh, commentary. The teacher of the year for the state of Oklahoma, and Oklahoma has one of the, uh, I mean, they pay their teachers uh, lower than, their, 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 their payment scale is lower than Louisiana, uh, way lower than Louisiana, uh, amazingly. Uh, and this individual had to take up a second uh, job uh, in order to support his family. And he was thinking of leaving the profession, and he's the Oklahoma Teacher of the Year for uh, 2017 having to think about leaving the profession. So we have to pay our teachers more and certainly our excellent uh, teachers. So um, getting back to the uh, tax, it's not about the money, but teachers like anyone else have to live a, uh, make a decent living to live a decent uh, life and do what they do best, which is educate uh, your children. So again, um, getting back to the uh, tax, I don't like paying taxes, uh, unfortunately. Uh, we have to, uh, you know, think about doing that to uh, improve education. As Huey Long used to, or Russell Long, Huey's son used to say, "Tax you, tax me, tax the man behind the tree." Yeah. But uh, <laughs> you know, we have to uh, be supportive of that, which will increase education and which will harbor better for the uh, future. So look at our outcomes now, project for the future, and it will take resources. So. I well, think sure. uh, more. And, and education is yeah. a wonderful investment. Yes, I exactly. Think the best investment. The, the more educated that your uh, population is, the less crime there is, less poverty. Absolutely. It, it has a cyclical effect Absolutely. on the entire community. So 100% agree with you on that. Now here's a fun question. If you could have dinner with, say, four or five different people, living or deceased, famous or not, mm -hmm. uh, who would they be and why? Okay, uh, first, uh, my Savior, uh, Jesus Christ, uh, because he is my Savior and the tremendous wisdom that he can and uh, would impart and does impart every day. Uh, secondly, uh, I didn't get to know her as well as I wanted uh, to. My grandmother, she's deceased, so I would like to uh, get some more wisdom uh, uh, from her and, again, the uh, best person that I ever knew. Um, I've always been fascinated with uh, Dr. Martin Luther King and what he uh, went through. Uh, so I would like to, because uh, so, some of his themes are predominating today. Uh, we're talking about a uh, fair wage. Bernie Sanders is pushing that in other politicians. Martin Luther King was pushing that in the uh, 60s yeah. as well as, uh, you know, many other progressive uh, issues. Yeah. Um, Robert Kennedy also has fascinated me. Uh, and the reason uh, is that he was able to reach across the um, barriers that yeah. exist in society and speak to African Americans, speak to Latinos, speak to uh, Native Americans, speak to uh, the Red State Americans, the Rust Belt, and he was able to um, harmonize uh, with them. And had he lived, I think he would have had a um, effect of bringing the country uh, together. The country at that time was ridden and torn much more than we are right. now. Uh, so I would have uh, liked to have seen him uh, become president and I would, 
would have loved to have uh, dinner with him. Mm -hmm. And then the last person um, would be a man who, um, Cesar uh, Chavez, and reading his story, mm -hmm. fighting for the migrant uh, workers, yeah. um, his fortitude, you know, his fortitude. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like to talk to him about his struggles and uh, where he, you know, um, would see an improvement because in many cases what he was fighting for individuals are still fighting for as it relates to uh, migrant uh, workers and those rights that uh, you know he was able to make an inroad so um, his courage uh, you know really hardens me. So, yeah. Well John last question um, is, this has been a, a wonderful interview and uh, thank you again for being here today but uh, in reaching all of the people that you've been in touch with your whole life, what legacy do you want to leave behind? How do you want people to remember you by? I would like people to remember me as a person who cared, as a person who tried to make his community uh, better, as a person who tried to be a uniter, mm -hmm. and as a person who was hopeful. And if I can be remembered uh, by those uh, standards, I think I've lived a good life. <laughs> I would agree. Thank you, John. Thank you. That concludes our interview. <laughs> Thank you.